so many thanks to Graham for uh, having come all of this way and shared his new project with us. Um, and it's a really exciting project and one that I'm very much cheering him on at, uh, not least because it seems to require much more employment for historians of science. <laughs> Good thing for historians of science looking for jobs. Um, um, as an aside, actually, obviously, I'm making comments today with my historian of science hat on. And I was wondering if Graham might want to say something more in the discussion about exactly which sort of hat he's wearing uh, for this project. Okay, so as I said, um, I'm really cheering this project on. Um, and there are three things in particular which I like about the project very much. Um, there are many other things about the project, but these are the three that I picked up on. Um, so the first is the kind of ontology of innovation or invention that's being done here. Um, and historians of science have done a lot of nice work, I think, on revolutionary innovations, incremental innovations, uh, collaborative innovations, all sorts of steamboats and steam engines and paper machines and such. Um, so there's a second question that I have for Graham. Um, do you think the type of innovation is linked to the type of rhetoric about invention? Um, is it the case that tool-like innovations become associated with certain types of rhetoric, whereas products don't? Um, something for discussion, maybe. Um, and that's the uh, second part of the project that I very much like, the, uh, the focus on rhetoric of creativity. Um, and this is something that historians of science also know a little bit about, um, although not so much. Um, but I wonder, as with history of science, whether there's anything to be done looking at the transmission of those rhetorics, and whether particular rhetorics occur in particular types of media, um, and whether there's a story to be told there. Um, and then finally, uh, the part of the project which I like most, which I think is something that historians of science are least good at, is looking at the function of these useful fictions of creativity. Um, so what IP law changes do they make? How do they impact in the real world? Um, and I think this is really one of the most exciting areas that's going on at the moment for history of science as well, because it's a nexus where so many issues come together. Um, science, commerce, uh, appropriation, development. Um, and I think with just a small amount of reflection, um, it seems crazy that there isn't more study on this area. So the idea of the single lone inventor or author, um, it seems like uh, an impossible fiction to maintain. And so one wonders why so much effort has gone into maintaining this fiction for so long. Um, and I think, uh, as I've said, that's something um, the historians of science aren't so good at. Um, but also, um, this idea of uh, the useful fictions that are created around creativity uh, speaks to something uh, about the law and its flexible and evolving nature. And I think very often historians of science will want to treat the law as though it were monolithic uh, and unchanging. And I think this is a very nice way of unpacking exactly those changes. Okay. So, um, just on that final point, I have a couple of more comments and questions. Um, so we're all very familiar with the usefulness of pretending that the boss does all the hard work. Um, except obviously not here, of course. <laughs> uh, the boss really does do all the hard work, I would like to point out. Uh, it's very useful to have a figurehead, someone around whom funding can be attracted um, and excellence can be claimed. So I would suggest, and Graham touched on this, that for the biotech industry at the end of the 80s, there were very particular reasons for indulging in this notion of the artistic inventive genius. Um, and I would suggest they probably had something to do with floating on the stock market. And this is as good a way of differentiating value as anything else to say, we've got the star on our team. Um, so if one makes that move, though, and relocates inventorship in a kind of artistic sphere of creativity, um, there's something that we can do to rescue Kerry Mullis somewhat. Um, so for artists, the idea of stealing is not only appropriate, it's lauded. Um, if Kerry Mullis really is a genius, then of course we should expect him to have stolen the idea. Um, as Pablo Picasso said, bad artists copy, uh, good uh, genius steals. Um, and he probably stole that himself off of T.S. Eliot, he probably stole it off of Oscar Wilde, he quite probably stole it off of Alexander Dumas. Um, so I was wondering if Graham could just say something about that intersection of um, subversive rhetoric, of so creativity, with this kind of scientific creativity. Okay. okay.
if you wanted to provoke us to think or question the work of an inventor, this guy is just about one of the best parts of it. Possibly <laughs> because he's an insufferable person. <laughs> but he just passed me his book, and I just couldn't believe it. Anyhow, I knew a myth was there, but this was beyond my imagination. It's interesting, because I, I was talking to a biochemist, a prominent biochemist, a Swiss biochemist, last week, and yeah. telling him about this workshop, and he was saying, we are going to talk about Karl Lewis, because you know, we try to invite him all the time to give talk to our students. And I was like, oh, really? Why? Because he's so colorful. He's a great role model for them. They can just you know, really think about what it means to shape up the world of science. And I'm like, really? So did you actually get him then down, and what was the effect? Well, we never really managed to get him. He always asked at least $20,000 to come down and give a talk about time. I was thinking, well, yeah. And anyway, it sort of matched my idea already formed about what this guy was about. I mean, I guess um, my comments could be probably summarized in what is the alternative? which is a problem I'm struggling very much with in my work. Right? So I think a lot of people would agree that the idea of the inventor and of the single inventor, Nobel Prize winner, just doesn't in any way, is not compatible with the way the science is done, especially the way the science is done now. But the question is, how do you then shape a legal institutional system which is based around claims of excellence without having that reference point? So either having you know, creators as a figure, or even just as a sort of role model and inspirator to what science stands for. And I guess um, two projects have been involved in which sort of got to that question, and we couldn't really answer them, where one on epistemology of science, during my PhD I was involved in a project which was starting to question the notion of scientific understanding. And the starting point of that project was what we call the Eureka, Eureka rhetorics. So I was very struck by the fact that this was the starting point for you know, your talk. Which was very much the idea of you know, the guy sitting in the bath and suddenly, you know, kind of, you know, the Pythagoras style, figuring out mm -hmm. a huge scientific idea. And um, the point of the project was basically to context the relation between science and technology and to think about the fact that something like theorizing always implies iterative interactions with experimental practices and basically ideas are never conceived without the practice of actually implementing them. And at the same time, kind of, you know, they're actually, through the practice, they actually get perfected and elaborated. So, in a sense, the final point of that project was to say, well, to actually define understanding means to define a skill in science. You understand something, you have a eureka moment, if you actually build up the skills through years of practice and collaborations to actually be able to understand something in a certain way. And that usually, <laughs> is actually not something you can ask to an individual. I mean, we tend to think about it as a cognitive process, as something that actually happens in someone's mind. But in fact, there's more and more models coming out within more epistemological discussion, discussing something like distributed cognition, the fact that in fact, you can really think even about cognitive abilities to understand something as something that happens within a group, rather than just something that can be ascribed to one person. And I think that actually speaks directly to this problem anyways, but then it leaves you with a big question. So what do you do? I mean, if you have that knowledge, how do you reshape scientific institutions to recognize this fact in a more direct way? Um, the other project that, again, speaks to this and gets you to the same question is a project that I'm engaged with right now with Rachel Ankeny and actually interacting with Walter Peden, who is a collaborator on the Bermuda Rules. And what we are trying to do there is to try to contest the notion of authorship in relation to so-called data-intensive science. So the idea is, you know, I mean, you're not in a situation where um, credit still comes to scientists through publication of papers and through patenting, but in fact a lot of other activities which are essential to building science, as you pointed out in different points of the presentation, don't get recognized in the same way. So the person who actually perfects the technique, the person who kind of puts together the data and curates them, the person who does all these kind of things, all these people are crucial parts of the process, but their contribution doesn't get as recognized as the first author of the nature paper that comes out of it. And um, there's a lot of initiative in science itself right now that are trying to tackle this problem, and really the main way we can try to tackle it is to bypass the publication system altogether. So basically to say, well, publication through big journals is not working anymore, we should think about open access, and in fact, even more, we should think about publishing data and publishing technologies separately from publishing papers. And in fact, that should be recognized as something which is a crucial part of science right now. And the problem is, if you take these movements again seriously, and you try, as we are trying to do, kind of more historically and philosophically, to think, 
What does it do to science? What does it then do to law? Is the question we are asking, we have absolutely no idea. But if you're contesting this notion of authorship and invention in such a radical way, then where does it bring you in thinking about legal recognition and patenting and questions? <laughs> Um, thank you very much for this fantastic talk and uh, um, discussing what makes um, authorship uh, such a persistent classification device, Michel Foucault observed, this course that possesses an author's name is not, uh, is not to be immediately consumed and forgotten, neither, neither it is accorded the momentary attention given to ordinary fleeting words, rather its status and its manner of reception are regulated by the culture in which it circulates. Disputes that throw authorship into question seem to make some of the most persistent assumptions entrenched in the fabrics of society explode. It is rather illustrative to open up this historic episode sorry, not um, and try and see what it entails for our understanding, thank you, um, understanding of the modern scientific enterprise. What's notable about Mullis is that he is one of the iconic examples of successful uh, scientific entrepreneurs. Apparently, he publicized his ups and downs freely and made himself a figure of public attention. As Stephen Shapin writes in his book, The Scientific Life, showing also photos of Richard Feynman, uh, Craig Venter, and James Watson, Bobblehead Doll, um, some scientists are skilled in self-presentation. It is not uncommon to hear these days that even some large uh, techno-scientific <coughs> agencies are um, outcomes of lobbying, if not outright public relations or PR. That is quite a different picture compared to the narratives of experimental modesty professed by uh, Robert Boyle in the study of the 18th century science by Shapin and Schaeffer. If, as science and technology studies have told us, some scientists are skillful strategists, they appear to be good marketers too. The invention discourses can be compared to the conventional narratives of discoveries, uh, where disagreements may occur on the attribution of scientific insights, their place and timing, as in Steve Wooger's 1976 study of the discovery of pulsars, participants and publications disagree on the date of discovery, and as Wooger observes, the variability of accounts of discovery and participants' <coughs> ability to read them as being consistent or inconsistent are ways available to participants of making sense of a discovery as a starting point. So my perspective is one of the one ethnographer of science and technology. Um, I have spent several years looking at university industry relations in the UK and in, in the US. And uh, what happens when, um, with the stories of scientific entrepreneurship and invention and discovery, when we get down from the limelight, as in the case of Mullis, to the office and lab spaces? And can things be see, seem different? Um, for me, the interesting thing is how I think intellectual property rights occur as a topic of significance or insignificance for my participants. How it becomes a part of a shop floor talk, for instance, about university industry collaborations, everyday practices, and an office of sponsored research and technology transfer, or part of university decision making. It can be said that patents and licenses embody potentiality of technological change and emerging relation analysis. In order to be actualized, such relations need to be read and interpreted as texts. From here, the talk statement that patent system is deliberately cal calibrated to protect incremental invention and that suits industry too, seems to make an inroad into a discussion about what such perceived alignment might involve. It also provokes the question, are things around patents that smooth it will look, for example, at the university industry boundary? In many ways, uh, the discussion questions we've been presented with turn into practical deliberations in situations when university industry research agreements are filed and licensing terms are negotiated. Distribution of knowledge about IP becomes a matter of everyday concern for scientists, university officers and administrators who all might disagree about the importance, need for and ways to resolve issues around IP. Such disagreement would be do documented in negotiations files, but not always. Some exchanges happen on the phone or in face-to-face -face meetings and little record, record is left. Corporate secrecy is one of the phenomena that challenge the idea that authorship can always be successfully accomplished. Shempin observes that secrecy and competition were new to the world of biological sciences that valued the purity and virtue of academic research. Mullis, along with Craig Venter, were a new type of scientific entrepreneurs, endorsing cultural patterns that were not necessarily easily accepted by uh, researchers in the field, often honing their open source ideals and free information exchange. 
So what sustains particular attributions of invention? The paper shows that it can be achieved through aligning with the existing patent system that privileges and uh, glorifies an individual inventor. Such an interpretive rigid move, as Stephen Hilgard observes, however ignores alternatives, such as the bundle of rights one concerns property, for example. This paper has um, usefully highlighted the need to be aware of the various, and again, as Hilgard would say, acceptable narratives of intellectual property. Such acceptability, or for example, Mullis, uh, Mullis's authorship of invention and putting it to practice, is, uh, as has been observed, sustained through an unspoken, perhaps, consensus. It was accepted partly because it was never challenged. Our task as researchers, it seems, is not as much or not only to be able to give precise answers to the questions about ownership, but analytically celebrate multiplicity and potential slippages of the authorship narratives and social ordering. Um, in the scientific life, Shapin acknowledges Mullis's dispute with Civis, he has states that Mullis was employed by Civis Corporation when he discovered PCR. The dispute is also presented as emerging later, and an assertion is made that Mullis never mobilized possible defense means, such as advancing a claim that the invention was not made on company time or as an upshot of company assigned duties. If claims to ownership can be seen as community performance, could the commentaries disputing Mullis's single owned inventorship? help him to win the serious case, or will such move yet another time put under critique the dominance of the individual uh, inventor narrative? Thank you. Um, I think it's very good that you opened this uh, session by saying that this is about formulating questions rather yes. than giving answers, <laughs> because I think if we were to expect you to answer all these questions, yeah. would really be a bit, but if you like a few minutes to oh, pick up on Thank you, yes, so. okay, I might need uh, these speakers to, to give me some gentle reminders of, of what I was asked, but uh, <laughs> as it, as it, as it, you know. um, but I know you asked me, what, did you ask me whether I'm looking at... Uh, uh, disciplinary hats. Yeah, disciplinary hats, actually I don't really know. Actually, um, see, well, see, I mean, I've got this sort of interest in what I call the history of pharmaceutical IP. I mean, people have, it's not history of medicine; it's something else. Mm. Yeah, um, so it really is uh, integrates really law with science and technology evolution, as you might call it, and also some sort of business. Right? Right. I mean, the pharmaceutical industry is very interesting going back to sort of 150 years or so. Not only because uh, new things became patentable thanks to the industry, but also, in a way, uh, modern IP strategy was, I think, invented by the German chemical firms a little bit before Edison. Right? And they were combining you know, patents with, not that I've mentioned at all today, but trademarks in a rather sort of clever way to sort of differentiate very similar products. Uh, so, um, which is not an answer, any kind of answer to your question, but. Uh, um, that reflects a little bit of confusion on my part on where, on where my work fits in, in terms of discipline. It's a little bit of a few things. Yeah. Now your other question was... Technological um, determinism-ish. I don't know you asked me that. But. Does the invention make the inventor? Does the invention make the inventor or does the inventor make the invention or is it a little bit of both or neither of the above? Or is all that? of the same. <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. Um, okay. First, let me, let me just sort of, you know, um, be really honest and say, um, I'm not quite willing to abandon, you know, you know, the event as a person, right? Uh, I mean, I think there are people who do play a major contribution in making in making things happen. So I'm all for them getting credit in some way or another. Um, um, you know, um, I mean, individuals do make a difference. You know, um, and um, and I think perhaps you know because I, I did I did this I've written this, this chapter for this book which will one day be published um, about why we name the inventor and patents actually why do we do it you know because uh, it's not it's not obvious that we should you know and um, German uh, well, um, well, Ger the German patent law of 1877 um, allowed well it didn't require companies to name inventors in the facts, they weren't required to. And actually, inventor naming was, uh, became required uh, by law in 1936 under the Nazis, right? 
when I say, it's a bit awkward, you feel like, well, if I think it's good, it's okay to name inventors, am I being a Nazi? It's like saying, it's vegetarian, well, you have to call them vegetarian, so, <laughs> does it make them a good Nazi if you don't eat meat? Um, well, but, <laughs> um, okay, so, um, so and, and what really happened there was why they entered the Paris Convention, which is the, uh, the main convention, international convention uh, on industrial property, including patents. Uh, why there is a, a sort of moral right of, of inventors to be named. Um, that really came out of, out of uh, it, was, it was a sort of, um, it was a, a sort of spin-off of an effort in the 1920s under the auspices of the League of Nations for scientists to have property in their discoveries, right? Uh, and that didn't quite work, I mean, Britain and the United States has largely killed it, uh, partly because we just thought it was a bad idea anyway, or we, I mean, the, the people, in, you know, the, the powers that be at the time, uh, but also because, you know, I mean, it was on the European continent where the scientific class, which you call them a class, which was a new class, you know, going back to the late 19th century, they weren't scientist employees before then, so they were quite a new group of people. After the First World War, when you know that the Europe was was wrecked, uh, and the status of uh, the position of scientists was not particularly good, so there was a, there was this this kind of campaign. Uh, but what happened then was that it, though that was the, that was a sort of defeat. It comes up indirectly in the U.S. Declaration of Human Rights, where they, they mention authors, but they mean authors and inventors. If you look at the actual the documents, uh, to to be you know to have basically attributed to their work. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, um, so in the Paris Convention Revision in 1934, it comes in, to, so that is all probably into the Paris Convention. Uh, so, <clears throat> and I think um, in this part of the world, right, in this part of the world, uh, we uh, are, apart from, you know, some academics, <laughs> um, most people are fairly comfortable with the idea, not only comfortable with the idea of uh, an individual being associated with their creative work, whether it's an invention or it's, or it's a novel or whatever, uh, but also think it's a good thing, right? It's a good thing that, that, is, that they'd be given that credit. You know? so, um, and that's, so there's a strong sort of cultural reasons why we do it this way, right? Now, of course, uh, that is, you know, uh, the fact that we, we do it this, work, this way it means, you know, somebody is making money out of it too. You know, it's like it's opportunity for someone to make money out of it too. You know, so uh, in terms of actual sort of deployment, now I said this, this this sort of paradox where where industry itself has ensured, right, that you don't have to uh, be a genius to get a patent, right, and ensured that you know incremental invention are patentable, right? So, you know, they don't generally go around talking about geniuses and inventors all the time, right? right? So, but it is selectively deployed, I would say, right? So, they'll the return to that so when it suits them, right? So, you know, I mean, if you move uh, just temporarily to uh, sort of copyright, you know, the, the sound recording right, right? Now, um, the sound recording right has recently, in Europe, has recently been been increased, and the reason why it was 50 years, and what 50 years is the beginning, because uh, 55 years now, is the beginning of popular music, basically, so Elvis Presley onwards, you know, Bill Hayden, the comics and all that, onwards, suddenly you had this huge big market, so all these guys are now getting old, and worried about their pensions. Right? Um, now, um, it's well known that the recording industry, who got these guys on, on, on rotten contracts in the first place, are going to be as you get most of the money out of this, right? But industry basically wanted the, the public to think this is all about these poor musicians, right? Who own and got a pension, right? Uh, leaving aside the fact the reason why they, they haven't got much money in their in their pension fund, I mean, I don't know, I'm going to have myself in there. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, most of us now are going to be worried about pension in a few years' time. Uh, some of you, uh, you know, have more years now, and I'm getting a bit closer than that. Um, but, um, you know, so, I mean, do we have to care about their pensions? Oh, I don't know. But, you know, at least that was, but that was the rhetoric they used. It goes back to the creative individual, the musician. So, 
the industry will, will do that when it suits them. Right? Uh, what about the poor individual, the poor inventor? Right? I mean, in, in, in patents, that's I would say it's becoming less useful than it is in terms of copyright, but still, you know, in certain cases, it comes out here and there. But it, they know they have to use it a bit more carefully, let's say. What's your other question? Uh, good artists uh, borrow uh, genius deals. Um, yeah, so, so does that work in terms of inventing and, and, and buys it? Uh, well, if Kerry Muller stole it, then he's more likely to be able to claim he's a genius. Well, right? it sounds as if he did, doesn't it? I mean, it does sound very, very suspect, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah very suspect. Um, yeah, um, but of course, in a way, there's, there's a dual argument here. On, on one hand, there's, there's this, okay, there's, there's an argument and there is an impression, right? The impression is he's a genius, so he must be an inventor, right? There's that. So that's almost unspoken in a way, right? But the pattern law argument is, right? He has assembled these existing ideas and techniques, right? Right? Now, all, I mean, according to uh, Arthur Kornberg, right? The problem why they didn't redo it because it's all done. Well, it's such an obvious idea. Why don't you think of it? You know, but why don't you do it? You know, and his answer is that well, because it was very difficult to synthesize primers before, right? Um, that was that was one of the important things. That was up to, and sequencing was incredibly very very slow and expensive and and just messy and difficult, right? So because of those improvements. Let's say sort of background sort of improvements in the science. You know, uh, it became an obvious thing for him to have tried, and it is something called impact or called obvious to try. You know, so of course he would have tried it. You know, so if it was obvious for him to have tried it, right, then it suits his interests to make out that he had this lightning bolt. You know, uh, because that is a bit of a weak point for him. Um, um, yes, that, that, that me. Um, my, my question was more about, uh, mostly about contested meanings and whether it matters yeah. if our common understandings or our scientific understandings of invention are different. Oh, actually, that's yeah. Oh, well, of course, you know, uh, uh, of course, you know, when you when you find you, you see these these you know, articles published, and then you have the patent applications, and somehow the, the number of people shrinks to about three or four people from. From uh, you know, seventy or more, you know, and what sort of happens? And of course, you know, it, 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 it science uh, for us, it, it, you know, social scientists, our, our our journal articles are works of literature, or something we like to think. <laughs> um, but for um, but for of course, of course, in science, well, it's also works of literature too, as far as the law is concerned, right? But what they're doing is reporting on something that they discovered. May invented, all right? Uh, so it doesn't matter whether you actually wrote the, wrote the article. You're one of the scientists who was who was sort of involved. Uh, so the authorship function is, is quite sort of a different thing there. Um, but the point is, is that these numbers do shrink down to a certain number of people. I think uh, you know, a sort of patent attorney goes around, and talks to the scientists, and say, well, you know, so <laughs> so so, so you you and you, uh, you know, so we, so which of you, okay? I, I need some names, names of inventors here. Okay, can you, can you sort of write them down? And I mean, there's been the odd, the odd case where somebody was excluded and they've, they've actually gone to court. It's been not stated to me. Uh, you know, I should be named, named as well, right? Um, and if they win, then they are also named too. But the patent then doesn't become invalid because that person wasn't named. So you have to identify a, a small number of people, usually sort of three or four people. There's a very common number, sort of three or four people. So those, you have to find these people. Um, um, but do those people, I mean, okay, so they are associated, associated, and I say that, you know, that's what that word, with the invention, they are close to it. But did they themselves do anything particularly inventive? Um, I don't think it, 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 it's, it's, it's not considered to be that important, really. It doesn't really matter that much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, um, yeah, um, so this person may be named because they worked in the same lab and they were somewhat sort of involved in one of this, but 
I mean, I, I, I think it's, sometimes it's very strategic, and sometimes it's not so strategic. You know, um, it's not quite sort of you know sort of put out where you made its names. It's not quite like that, but I mean to say it doesn't occasionally happen too. Um, but I mean, the patent is not going to be in danger because you say this person didn't really do anything much. I don't, I think they didn't. I, mean, I don't think that's a normal line of attack. Yes, on the patent really. Yeah. So at, at least one of those people has to. Yeah, unless you get two different lads arguing about who, who did it, but yeah. Yes, but of course, if one changes company or something, who is it? Yeah, uh, yeah um, well, yes, then it may be, well, that person's testimony, you know, then may become important, important in the court, yeah. 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 Uh, what's, that, what's another question? Um, well, I think that's the okay. question. Right. So, can I yeah. ask, maybe on this point, yeah. the, can it be implied that uh, these three foot people can be identified strategically? Assuming there can be a patent dispute, is that? Um, if there's a patent dispute, it rests really on whether it was it was it was uh, new. The the yeah. inventor's step. So um, the testimony of one of those inventors may actually be quite valuable, but um, but that's not the decisive thing really at, at that point. No, I, was, uh, I guess my question was what are the alternatives because uh -huh. I was taking you to be rather critical and I was now curious to hear that you were actually saying no, this is actually the sort of value to recognizing individuals but then you now also said individuals that actually do the work may have nothing to do with individuals who recognize the pain. Yeah. So I'm now getting yeah. very confused about yeah. whether you like the system or not. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. Let me just see if I can think of something here. Okay, so... Um, so all right, okay, so I, I've been skeptical, let's say. I've been skeptical, um, let's say I'm skeptical about objective claims about who an inventor is and who is not part of that circle of people who is an inventor, right? I'm skeptical about our ability in all cases to be objective, right? Um, right, uh, but, um, and if you don't believe in that system at all and think it should be abolished, that's sort of risk to the mill and it's another thing you can take for, right? But if I'm not convinced, I'm not sure, I'm not convinced that the world would be a better place without patents at all, right? I might say, okay, so how do we make this system uh, work, mm -hmm. right? Bearing in mind that the inventor function is not necessarily in the public interest, wherever that is, or it's in the interest of private in who may you know, uh, you know, who use this for their own purposes. Um, um, I am um, um, perhaps I am sort of unradical enough to think uh, that. Um, I would rather have individuals associated with the invention as well as a company rather than just a company. Does that, does that, does that help? I'm not sure because what I'm seeing when yeah. I look at the publication yeah. side of the deal is papers yeah. get increasingly more yeah. authors. I mean, okay. there are papers with <coughs> hundreds of authors, and the reason for this is they can't deal with authorship as we currently conceive it. Okay, so well, okay, so so what, what, what I see what you're saying here. So what today? So that while there may be a, a justice in including certain people, that is likely or perhaps will always involve exclusions of others, which would be unfair. Yeah, I mean it's just very yeah. hard for me. I think it is becoming more and more hard because yeah. you know, more people are involved. There's more professionalizations. Okay. Involved, more global networks. <coughs> I just don't see how this system is sustainable. Unless you make it a purely strategic decision, okay, I pick these two people because they're our representatives, yeah. <laughs> and that has nothing to do with actual invention in yeah. a romantic sense, and it has all to do with how you deal with the legal yeah. kind of rights yeah. to it. Yeah, okay, all right, yeah. That would be my provocation, but you know, okay. I don't know anything about it. Yeah, it's just... well, okay, let me think about that one, uh, but, but I don't think I've asked that one right now, but I'll, 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 I'll uh, that would be one of my thoughts on the train back home, all right? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, but in terms of, like you said, it matter. I mean, this is a perfectly so legitimate thing that that is patentable, right? A lab uh, technique which has 
somehow, somehow, as long as you say it has some, at least in Europe, industrial application, you know, uh, well, not say they say useful, well, certainly useful, there's no question about that. Uh, industrial application, that, that, I don't know. Yes, I guess, it, I suppose one can, I mean, it, it, it's, that, that is a requirement that is imposed in a very light way, right? Uh, it is new, not, it's an unobvious, the fact that you, you, you can be bothered to patent it implies that it's some sort of industrial application. I mean, it, 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 it's a fairly, as, uh, you know, undermining requirement usually. Um, so it is a normal thing to be capital. It is a, a um, you know, it is it. Well, it's chemistry, isn't it? It's about you know, it's a, it's, it's a chemical invention, right? A chemical invention, and it is a process, uh, not a a product. So it's, it's quite a normal thing. So this, you know, the patent application like this doesn't, it doesn't, it, you know, presented to a to a to patent examiners. Is not itself anything radically different from the sort of applications that they've been getting for, for decades or, or even 100 years. Yeah. It is an evolution. Um, but of course, in, in biotech, we're also thinking about patenting of, of sort of life forms, and that becomes much more questionable. Now, I wrote this, uh, I wrote this article, which I uh, called Who Invents Life? Uh, just engineers, uh, blind watchmakers, or intelligent designers. So I, I sort of this discussion about sort of, you know, that sort of discussion in, 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 in the kind of patent law. And I sort of argued actually that, obviously I've been in evolution, not to uh, design. I, I hate to say that. But um, uh, but, um, um, what, what, what I sort of argue is that actually at the level of a cell or a multicellular uh, organism, you know, cells, uh, uh, microbes, animals, plants have a sort of autonomy they're as a complex beyond understanding, uh, and perhaps we don't have that level of genuine uh, sort of control over that living entity that we would have over mechanical invention, or even a sort of, you know, uh, the usual sort of, sort of small molecules that are impactable for 100 years. Um, maybe this really is a stretch uh, sort of too far. Now, um, to which, uh, uh, this judge, I, I, I did also the book chapter, and the uh, uh, this is one of the, uh, and the, the, the forward written by a judge uh, or Justice Jacob, as he was then, who actually singled out my article for criticism, basically said, saying that, um, well, you know, I mean, that doesn't matter. It's just you know, as long as it works, it doesn't matter whether you don't understand it properly, whether you got it wrong, or anything. You know, you know, you know, if something is based on quantum theory, as long as it, as long as it sort of works. Then it's okay, you know. That's what he said, anyway. In, in terms of, you know, as a, as a testing my argument here, um, but, but actually, I, 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 actually, I do think, you know, sort of reasoning by analogy from chemicals to microorganisms is, is difficult. But from chemicals to plants and animals, I mean, for me, it, it just it does go a little bit far. And if if we want to legislate to allow these things to be patentable, that's you know, that's one thing. Uh, but just allowing these things to stretch. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I, I can see strong arguments for saying, you know, that's that's taking patent law in somewhere that is actually genuinely really different. And do we believe we might be doing that? Do we think the integrity of the patent system is is so important that we just stretch it just because the industry wants that? So that's that's another matter. Um, well, then, uh, any other questions? Um, the last episode and the uh, history of Homer's dispute with Cephas, and uh, whether you know if he mobilized any arguments to sustain the claim that he did not invent uh, PCR on the company time, or ah. that sort of thing, and that, would that change the, the story of Ah, on, on the company, so yeah. what, what were you saying, that uh, because he, ah, um, <coughs> no, well, well, he never tried to take his pattern with him, no. No, no. Um, the, you know, well, of course, he said the uh, the you know the flash of inspiration was in his car, mm -hmm. obviously outside the premises. Outside, yeah. <laughs> uh, but everything that he, he did beforehand and afterwards. Uh, yeah. So he said he took all his notes, uh, and he was just getting on there toilet paper and paper. Mm -hmm. In fact, anything he had no paper on it. You know, with paper out. What's my idea? He write down really quick before I forget it. So so, so he, he's doing that, but then he, you know sort of Monday morning goes back to his office. Yeah. And all his paper with his stuff on it. Uh, but then he had to like try and make it work. So all experiments were tested, they're all 
So, no, that, that wasn't, that, that, that didn't sort of come yeah. up. But the question is coming from yeah. just one observation. I attended an event like Masterclass of more senior scientists teaching um, undergraduate uh, students about uh, entrepreneurship and yeah. in the university here. And one of them was saying, well, you basically do your experiments in your house basement if you don't want to, you know, yeah. get into that conversation with the university. So is that, is that community <laughs> practice? Is that yeah, that yeah. To well, yes. Uh, so, well, actually, yeah. The funny thing is, he actually didn't. He was he was asked to publish, you know, and he didn't. He actually wanted to keep it secret all to himself. I mean, all, I mean, he wanted to keep it in house, but not, you know. I'm not quite sure why why he didn't want to publish it. But he didn't. You know, funnily enough, the uh, the other the other guys who you know, mm -hmm. uh, their article was published. Uh, his was actually rejected. They thought it was the same old stuff. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Funny enough, uh, because they described a workable technology, which obviously was interesting to I think it's was well, science or nature, uh, uh, and his was uh, was rejected. Um, uh, it ended up getting published somewhere, Journal of Enzymology, something like this, or some not so well known. Uh, um, so, but now I don't think it's ever it's ever an issue about actually where it was, and he. Um, he was actually sort of corporate enough not to try and uh, sort of take it with him or keep it secret from his colleagues. I think he actually wanted to get, to have the praise, you know, the credit of his uh, of his sort of workmates. You know, so he, he told them anyway. So once he, done, he told them about it the, the following week, then that was it really. Then it had to be, uh, uh, you know, yeah, 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 his employment contract. And that was it. Once he, he revealed it to, to them. Of course, he needed their help, but he didn't think he did at first. But he didn't need their help to make it work. So he was trying to build a network around himself that would support his um, way of life? Well, well, he had this um, young guy called Fred Faluna, I think his name was. And he was um, somebody who wasn't, he didn't have a PhD, I don't know if he even had a degree. And uh, it leads me to wonder if he's a sort of, sort of insecure guy who needs to have somebody who's uh, a sort of yes man who's grateful to him for the job. Um, Maybe it's his Sancho Panza, yeah. though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, so, where was I? Uh, I don't sort of digress. I'm not quite sure where was it, actually. Yeah. Just like if he was building a network yeah. around Oh, yeah. Well, no, there the, 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 the was a sort of network of two, really, because, um, you know, <laughs> trying to reach out. And, and just no one liked him very much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. I guess we've got time for just um, one or two questions. Um, yeah, I was I was thinking about a bit about the inventorship relationship, less in terms of equity and yeah what we deserve, but in terms of accountabilities. Yeah. And that, and that a patent is knowledge in the public domain, yeah. and as you pointed out very, very strongly, it, it's an enablement. Yeah. And we're responsible for that enablement in society as something, A, that allows somebody to do something, but it, B, it allows somebody to know what else they might be able to do in order to improve the world. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it has two roles. And as inventors, we're accountable yeah. for that process. Yeah. And by being nominated as an inventor, we are uh, making a consent for that information in the form in which we made it, constructed it, to go into the public domain as a working yeah. entity yeah. for those purposes. And yeah. It seemed to me that that, that aspect of inventorship, the, the consent, because when we when we file, well, yeah. when somebody files a patent for us, we still have to sign our name on it. Yes, so that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So, yeah, it, it was just something that came to me while we were yeah. talking. You know, I, 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 I've got a lot of patents, and 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 I, I was asking myself why I feel good about being an inventor. I mean, on there as an inventor because on many occasions I've done absolutely like mother's zero lab work. <laughs> <laughs> had the original idea, but it's, I think it's the thing about being held accountable 
you know, the pride in being held accountable for something that then gets used as a mechanism for doing something else. You know, yeah. Providing the means of inventing a round or yeah. stimulating another idea, which presumably mothers the PCR Mark three. Yeah. Yeah, but he, yeah, oh, he didn't really go that much further, really. I mean, no, no, he he's that piece of a company to yeah. do PCR, I think, on celebrities or something. I don't know what it was, <laughs> but definitely he got very far. So, uh, yeah, 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 he's sort of looking for a role, you know. I mean, he, yeah. Others found a role for PCR, but others weren't able to find a role for, for Kelly Morris. <laughs> <laughs> he can't either, but charge lots of money for, uh, for his appearance money. Yeah. For, uh, yeah. I wonder, I'm just following that and, and partly on Spina's question that you were thinking more about. But I mean, I, I wonder whether this is sort of reflects um, a, a something that we tend to think of as so obvious, but isn't obvious, which is that basically any of the, I mean, all kinds of projects in mm -hmm. contemporary societies require some kind of a figurehead, some yeah. kind of responsible person. Yeah. But actually, so we look, you know, maybe the banking crisis, maybe we back there were no CEOs in banks. I mean, just a bunch of people got together and had a discussion, you know, um, and nobody was. I, I, I guess nowadays you have a big building, hundreds and th thousands of people involved, there has to be an architect. And, whereas, I don't know, maybe Gothic cathedrals, did they have architects? I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, they, yeah. Well, they, I mean, they, they obviously had many of them. Yeah. Yeah. They kept dying because they went on for hundreds of years and somebody decided to open another tower. I mean, I guess maybe I've, you know, buying into a slightly romanticised view of the Gothic, but, <laughs> but, um, but I mean, it, it is, I and mean, I guess, you know, we, we always have to have these, these um, authority figures behind yeah. anything, and, and maybe it's just part of a, of a, you know, an individualist, part of the individualism, which yeah. is often picked out as a yeah. distinguishing feature of our age. Yeah. And yeah. Maybe it's, yeah. maybe the point of Sabina says is actually, it's really, in some areas, falling apart because the process is getting too complicated. Nobody understands the whole thing, um, yeah. and and the, yeah. the the need to put somebody in that responsible position is actually an obstacle to to the, to the continuation of the process effectively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think. I'm probably just this just a yeah. thought. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm trying to yeah, I'm trying to think of all the sort of all, all the functions of. The individual here, yeah. um, you know, yeah, in a sort of there's always this. I mean, in, in the business world, there's this tension, isn't there? And there's the corporation and there's the individual, and and I think it's. Uh, um, I mean, there's there's yeah. obviously this question of responsibility. Yeah. Often, but yeah. But I guess a patent holder. I mean, are you responsible if your um, invention is horribly misconceived and um, people try and do it and blows up and kills them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, there's, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Is, is yeah. It, is there um, a uh, that's yeah, so if you if you can practice the invention and you blow yourself up. There was this this uh, there is um, an old uh, German chemical patent and it, it often said before the First World War that the German German chemists they, they put a lot of lies into the patent. <laughs> so they're something more advanced than anybody else. If you examine them in Britain, yeah. they wouldn't know any difference. So they put a lot of lies. So once they get up to speed, they actually know how to how to, how to sort of copy the stuff. They they'll you know it, it won't work. Uh, and and uh, one complaint was that one of these patents, um, if you actually did it, it would actually kill you. It would actually blow you. But um, that 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 uh, has been contested by someone who says. Um, this was just anti-German rhetoric at the time. The Germans were very popular at the time of the First World War, so that's it. Actually, it wouldn't have blown you up, yeah, at all. Um, but are you, are you actually accountable for? Well, I guess if, if somebody did practice to a mention and blow themselves up, you, would you be legally accountable? I'm not really sure. No, probably not, because um, it's gone through a patent examination. It was, a, it was a, on the other hand, if it were a patent application, right? Which was published after it might before the patent was granted. <laughs> Supposing some sort of terrorist group. <laughs> I think that you're confusing the author function and the inventor function here, right? So with the author function, the problem is that the Inquisition might well turn up and 
torture you for some kind of heresy, right? And that was one of the reasons why authors needed to be named. Yeah. For censorship and other reason. Yeah. With inventors, uh, I don't know, could you perform a heretical invention? A uh, heretical invention? What were like on uh, give an example? No, I was being fantastical just for the sake of fancy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's actually the key of the problem, right? Yeah. The fact that, I mean, the way in which this was discussed now also made me think, I mean, the discussion of yeah. authorship, which I'm very involved in, is really mirrored here. Yeah. But it seems to me that there are very different functions, as Steve was saying. I mean, there's a question of social accountability, and I'm not entirely sure in which way it comes into the pit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm being on the skeptic side, so I might not want to say much about what I mean. But, you know, I mean, and, and then there's the question of recognizing what is the source of creativity, which yeah. you were discussing there. Yeah. Yeah. But, but how the two are related, I'm not sure. I mean, I was contesting the creativity point. Oh. Yes. Yeah, I um, just uh, going on Beres's point about whether the invention defines the inventor, etc. Yeah. The other round. I mean, I think to a degree you might say there's a distinction between the process of invention and the social function of the inventor, because yeah. Having an identified a, a inventor, basically, if someone is trying to access the invention, particularly when they're trying to understand the process of invention, they will look for an inventor as the sort of gateway to understanding the invention. In the same way that uh, with uh, creative, with, cre with um, like creative texts or art, you will go to the artist the, or the author as your means of if you're going to ask questions about the production of the text or the piece. And do you, do you think there's a sort of importance, importance about that, that having an inventor is a way of being able to sort of not just have the uh, artifact, but understand the creation of the artifact in itself, or at least have, an, have a belief that you can get to that artifact's creation? Yeah. So, okay. so I, I think in, in sort of practical terms, are we actually just thinking about the sort of credibility of the invention is stronger where I'm, to, I'm, I'm talking uh, I'm talking in uh, in practical, yeah, practical okay. terms in that yeah. where, in that people you know with inventions they don't just seek to use them, they seek to understand them. Yeah. And they seek to understand them by going back to the source. Yeah. In the yeah. same way that we say, oh, do you know X's books? And we discuss X's books for five minutes, and yeah. then I say, oh, but do you know him? Yeah. But we like to imagine there's a kind of special source of access to understand no, I mean, about the book, and that's the physical person who wrote it, in the same yeah. way as with inventors, would you get anything special from there being a person who one could email and say, well, oh, what did you do here or there? Yeah. Or OK, so so, so, so now it is to, you know, we'll name, the, name, we'll, so name the author, so it's, so, so it's you know, very Chalmers' book, not Valpage's book. Yeah, and to aid that fiction, yeah. that there is a kind of source of information about this artefact, yeah. other than the artefact itself. That oh, we is it a big fiction? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, if you ask most authors about what does this book mean, um, they'll say, well, I don't know, it was a Thursday, I was thinking about rain, and you know, this fictional character streamed out onto the page. I understand it as much the as you do. Anyway. Not all of them, surely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It depends on the area. Depends if the Inquisition's been around. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a good point, and I think about that. Yeah, we've thought about it before. Yeah, sorry. I was just going to say there's something in terms of if you're thinking in a very patent law sense, you can license a patent, but sometimes you want to license the know how that comes with the patent. And maybe, I mean, it's not really what you're talking about, I don't think, yeah. in terms of getting to understand yeah. it in a theoretical sense. But there is in industry, I think, some sense that the patent alone doesn't get at the full sense of the invention, and that you sometimes need the the penumbra, the extra bits that the inventors might yeah. have. So yeah. I, I'm not sure that's quite what you were getting at, but I think there is a practice. But, but sometimes, from what you're saying, you might actually be that it wouldn't be the inventor on the patent you needed, it would be maybe the lab technician who wasn't even mentioned on the <laughs> possibly, lab. Yeah. Possibly but that's what I'm saying, that it seems to me that actually it shows exactly what's wrong with yeah. this, yeah. which yeah. is yeah. that yeah. if you want to get to the scientific yeah. process, mm -hmm. this is just exactly not the way to do it. Well, I, I, the question that occurs 
sense to me yeah, at this point. It's nothing to do with the, the credit function of a patent and giving the inventor yeah. credit, the credit for yeah. inventing. But is a patent about that, or is it more about an incentive? And if it's about an incentive, then the inventor is almost irrelevant. It's the only that we need to think about. And obviously they're linked. Well, yeah. But if it's all you know, a, a case of choosing from a big group of people who all work for the same company, then it's mm -hmm. not going to matter who's in the inventor because the owner will be the same. Yeah. But that comes to a very corporate model of invention, which yeah. doesn't necessarily tap into all. And really get the level of price of it. <laughs> well, but do they need to be named as inventors, yeah. or is the paper that comes out more important? Yeah, one has got like a I think you pay pay about a thousand dollars for bonus for that. Yeah. So yeah. So he wasn't doing that for the money, but uh, um, uh, but yeah. Um, uh, sure. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Having dodged these very difficult um, questions, I notice it is the time when officially we might repair this discussion to where I believe we shall find a glass of wine out. But before before we do that, just, just when I just wanted to uh, say. Uh, I, I tended to thank, I may just mention, the various sponsors, but I'd also like to specifically thank Barris um, for an enormous amount of work in coordinating all the unruly sponsors and actually getting everybody together and, of course, um, I'd like to thank you again for coming in. Thank you. And thank you. It was a wonderful talk and, and thank very you. stimulating discussion. So thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you all to the other speakers as well for keeping the... Co-inventor. 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 Co